Welcome to season two of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks about COVID-19 testing with Dr. Yuka Manabi, an infectious disease doctor at Johns Hopkins and an expert in diagnostics. They break down the different kinds of tests, how each test works, and what the future looks like for COVID testing. Let's listen. Yuka Manabe, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So we brought you here today because you're an expert in both infectious diseases and testing. And something we've been hearing about a lot for the last six plus months is testing for COVID. And I'd like you to run through with me today the different kinds of tests there are and their pros and cons. But I'd like to start with the type of testing that was being done or has been done at the White House, considering the outbreak that has happened at the White House. So if you could talk to me about what are they using over there? So the White House is using a molecular test. That is a test that looks at the RNA, a part of the virus, directly. So it is a direct test to try to make more of that or amplify that particular part of the virus, also called RNA. And if it's present, it will ring positive or negative. So it's a qualitative test in that you don't find out how much virus you have. You only find out if you're positive or negative. They've been using one called the Abbott ID Now which is a little different than maybe a person who might have gone to a testing tent. The Abbott ID now just takes a swab, which you put into your nose. It can either be self-collected or collected by somebody else. And then it's directly placed in the instrument and swished around. And then it does its job. You essentially close it. And then it gives you an answer about 12 minutes later. What's nice about the Abbott ID now is it's a fast test. What's uh, perhaps a little bit not as good is that it tends to be a little less sensitive than the automated platforms that you might find in a big reference lab. But overall, it's more sensitive, say, than an antigen test, which is another way to to find proteins that are on the virus. So slightly different kind of test. So the White House has been using that. In the beginning, it was my understanding that every single person that came into the White House was being screened. And then more recently, maybe since June, it's my understanding that only those people that would come in contact with the president had been screened. So they kind of changed their screening methodology partway through. So I guess the question is, how accurate are these tests? And being told you were negative, did that necessarily mean you weren't able to spread it? So those are two different questions. To take the first question, if you're asking about the sensitivity of the test, how much can you trust a result? Well, we now know that molecular tests do have false negatives, that you could still have COVID even if you had a negative test. It doesn't happen very often. It particularly doesn't happen when you have the most virus, which is usually in the first five days of symptoms. So we would expect that if you were in the first five days of symptoms and a molecular test like the Abbott ID now told you that you were negative, you probably don't have infection. If you're further out, it's a little bit more difficult to say, and finding virus becomes harder the longer you go out. The second part of your question was whether or not you can infect other people. That's a slightly different question. Usually it is true that the people that can infect other people have the most amount of virus. So again, infectious people are likely to be found by a test like Abbott ID now and other molecular tests. Even if you're slightly less sensitive, those people have the highest burden of virus in general. But infectivity is more about whether or not you could culture the virus. Is the virus actually alive? And neither of those tests, the antigen test that I told you about, or the molecular test, like the one being done at the White House, would be able to tell you if you have infectious virus. That's different. That would require a lab where you would then take the sample and apply it onto particular types of cells. The most common cell is a Vero cell. And you see whether or not that cell starts to crumple up 
because it's been infected by a virus. And you have to look under a microscope and then you have to confirm that the reason that it crumpled up was specifically due to SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. So those are two very different questions. Well, thank you for clarifying for me. That test you just described, is that a test that we do for COVID? We have done it in the lab here at Johns Hopkins. We have a biosafety level three lab. So because it can be aerosolized, you want to make sure that you grow the virus in very specific conditions where you couldn't have a laboratory accident where other people might get infected. So at Hopkins, Dr. Andy Pekosh does those tests in his BSL3 lab, and he can culture virus and let you know whether it's specifically due to SARS-CoV-2. But he's doing that to study it. He's not doing that as diagnostic, correct? That's correct. So this is not something that you would have done. In fact, there are very few labs in the United States where you could have that done. So we are trying to come up with ways to determine if someone has infectious virus other than that. Right now, the best surrogate is kind of quantity and days after infection. Most people will stop having infectious virus after about 12 days of symptoms. There are outliers, but the majority of people, 95 plus percent, would not have an infectious virus after about 12 days. And you can have it, of course, though, in the asymptomatic period before you develop symptoms what some people are also calling a pre-symptomatic phase. So probably for two or three days before you have symptoms, you could also have infectious virus. And that is the scary part about SARS-CoV-2 is that you can be transmitting it to other people when you don't even know that you have infection yourself. So antigen tests and molecular PCR tests, those are the two major types of tests that we do to diagnose SARS-CoV-2. And those are both nasal swabs that are sent to a lab. Sometimes it takes a short period of time and sometimes a longer period of time. Do we have other tests at the moment to diagnose? And do we need better tests to diagnose? So the majority of the tests that we currently have are molecular tests and antigen tests. There are new tests being developed, but they are not currently available. There are four approved emergency use authorized antigen tests. Some are as easy as a card that you can read yourself. They take about 10 to 15 minutes. And then there are three others that require a reader device. So it's still like a pregnancy test where it flows across, but you have to put it into the device at the end in order to be able to say whether or not it was positive or negative. So the device helps you read whether or not that line is there or not there. So we don't have any tests right now that work on breath, for example, but another sample type that might be coming up more often would be saliva. Now, not all saliva is the same. Some saliva is better at different times of illness, but at least early on during the time when you might be most infectious, saliva turns out to be an okay sample type. And what's nice about it is it's easy. It's easy to spit or drool into a container as opposed to having somebody shove something into your nose. Nasopharyngeal swabs, most people don't enjoy having that type of test. So coming up with sample types that you can either collect yourself or are reasonable sample types, I think are going to be an important area of research and work moving forward so that people have more options. If you have to get tested every week, say, you didn't want to have a nasopharyngeal test. You probably would prefer to have a test that would be easier and feel less invasive. So this is for diagnostics. Then there is something called an antibody test, which I understand you take blood for. Tell me about what you're looking for there and how accurate that is. So antibody tests look for exposure to SARS-CoV-2. So it means that you have been exposed and productively infected, and you may have been symptomatic or you may not have been. All that test can tell you is that you were exposed. It can't tell you anything else. It can't tell you whether you were exposed two weeks ago or six weeks ago or eight weeks ago. You can only know that you were exposed. So what does it measure? It measures different antibody types, IgM, IgA, IgG. IgG is the one that sticks around for the longest. So it's the one that people tend to measure and seems to be the most reliable. IgM is not as reliable and many of the tests don't even measure IgA. 
Some tests actually just measure immunoglobulin of any type, so antibody of any type, and it will just say whether it's positive or negative. So how could you use a serologic test? Well, say you had an infection back in March and you weren't able to get tested. It was at the throes of the shutdown here in Maryland, for example, and you just couldn't figure out how to get tested. But now you're curious, you really want to know, is it possible that I had COVID back then? Getting an IgG test may be really helpful. You might be able to say, well, I have antibody to SARS-CoV-2 and I had COVID-19. Another time when it's really helpful, I think I said earlier on that there are people who can have a molecular test that might be negative if they're further out from symptoms. So maybe they're like two weeks out and their molecular test was negative, but everything about their appearance seems very consistent with COVID-19. You could do a serologic test in such a person, and if it were positive, it may help you determine that they were molecular test negative because their virus RNA had already gone away, but that that immunoglobulin or serologic test was helpful in that person to make that diagnosis. I think the way it's being used the most, though, is to see what proportion of any population has been exposed. So you could do a random sample of say a thousand people in a population of some number. And as long as it was a random sample and you check to see how what proportion of those people had antibody, you could know what the prevalence was, the zero prevalence we call it, what proportion of those people in fact came in contact with SARS-CoV-2 and got COVID. Why is that interesting? Well, if people, if you've probably heard about herd immunity. Many people say that when we get over something like 60%, you might be able to have some control of the spread of COVID-19 by having so many people around that you have a lot of what we call dead-end hosts. Say I had already had COVID and you get COVID and you cough on me, probably a decent chance that I'm then going to be able to control that exposure and I won't get sick again. Now, we don't know that for sure though, because we don't have enough experience. The longest experience that anyone could have with COVID-19 right now is about nine months, right? Because it turned up sometime at the end of December and now it's, uh, well, I guess it's October now, so 10 months. So that's about as long as you can know how long an antibody could last because before then we didn't have SARS-CoV-2 and we didn't have COVID. There is some evidence from SARS-1 that could be helpful. Um, We do know that over time, antibody does wane. People always say, if I have antibody, am I protected? That's what people want to know. The problem with giving a straight answer to that is that the way that you tell if you're protected or not is with something called neutralizing antibody, which is sort of our best way of telling right now. Neutralizing antibody, again, needs a very special lab, can't be done in very many labs in the United States, and tells you whether or not you can prevent the virus from growing. If you add, you have cells that are growing and you add the virus, and you add your serum as part of your blood in there, and it prevents the virus from growing, then you can know that you have neutralizing antibody. So it's difficult. Some people think that antibody to a particular part of the spike, which is this protein that sticks out from outside of the virus, is a reasonable surrogate for neutralizing immunity. But about 80% of people who have had COVID who are in the hospital develop neutralizing immunity and 95 plus percent of people develop antibodies. So not everybody that gets an antibody response gets a neutralizing immune response. I think I could talk to you about this all day. My last question is is pretty broad, but if we could do it quickly, do we need better tests or are we good with the ones we have? I think we could use better tests and I think we could use better tests that are good for particular places. So Sometimes you need more sensitivity, sometimes you need more speed, and we certainly need tests that are cheaper. So coming up with affordable tests, maybe if we had really, really sensitive tests, we could take 10 people's specimens and pull them together and then figure out if anyone in those 10 people had been infected. If we could do that, then we could spend one-tenth of the amount of money on a single test and say those 10 people, in fact, don't have it. So I think we need more innovation not just on the types of tests we have, but how we use them. I think what would be really great is if as a country, we could get below a certain level, we might then be able to just test symptomatic people and all of their contacts. So doing all the things we can to get the general level 
of COVID-19 down will be really helpful because then we'll need fewer tests to continue to suppress further transmission. And that's where we all want to get. We want to get back to something that feels more normal than where we are right now. So hopefully that wasn't too long an answer, but I think that's what we need. We need more of everything. We need more innovation around how we use tests. We need to make sure that people have access to tests, but then also we as a society do everything we, that we can to prevent infection as we know it now, which is to wear masks, to put in personal protective public health measures in workplaces, and to work harder on a vaccine ultimately. So there's a lot of things that are going to go into this, but I think that we all have to do our part if we want to move forward together. Dr. Manabi, thank you so much for joining me. It was my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, Cian Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening. Thank you.